Good morning. I'm, I'm David Wang. I'm one of the new musculoskeletal radiologists. And uh, I definitely want to say thanks to Scott Campbell and all the great faculty and the residents who have been so helpful in putting this course together. I think it's, it's been a great uh, experience. I'm excited today to talk to you about uh, uh, the calf and ankle. And at the end of this, I uh, will have reviewed the normal anatomy of the calf and ankle, uh, as well as its normal sonographic appearance. And then uh, I'm going to cover some uh, common pathology we'll see in different par uh, portions of the calf and ankle, uh, by no means an exhaustive list. So everybody's heard the joke, how do you hide a dollar from a radiologist? You put it on the patient. And I, I do this to uh, kind of emphasize that musculoskeletal radiologists, you know, uh, or a radiologist should have a, uh, an interest in trying to get close to the patient. And uh, this way, you won't miss out on any hidden dollars. So let's start with a calf. Thanks. So uh, when we examine the calf, uh, there's a typical checklist. Uh, it includes the medial and lateral heads of the gastrocnemius muscle, um, deep to which lie the plantaris and the soleus uh, uh, muscles and tendons, um, and then the Achilles. But I'll include that in my discussion of the posterior ankle. So if you place your probe in the transverse position along the posterior aspect of the calf, you'll wind up with an image like this. And if you're familiar with MRI anatomy, uh, it's not that different. We see the medial and lateral heads of the gastrocnemius muscles overlying the soleus. Here's a panoramic view of the posterior calf showing a similar uh, orientation. Again, we see the medial and lateral heads of the gastrocnemius muscles overlying the soleus. And we can follow these muscles and tendons up and down in the transverse position. If we turn our probe into the longitudinal direction, you'll wind up with an image like this. And here I depict the uh, medial gastrocnemius muscle overlying the soleus. And if we move medial or lateral, you'll get more of the lateral gastrocnemius. OK, so uh, common things you can see in the uh, calf. Uh, in the anterolateral leg, uh, muscle herniations are very common. Uh, often they'll present as a lump, and, uh, and the common locations you'll see this are in the middle to lower one-third of the leg and the anterior intermuscular septum uh, between the anterior and lateral compartments of the lower uh, one-third. At tibialis anterior, tendon is the most common, and uh, on ultrasound we'll see discontinuity of the overlying fascia with uh, focal herniation, and uh, it may be important to place the patient in a provocative uh, position, either in the standing or squatting position, to increase leg pressure, and then uh, it's important to look for signs of uh, necrosis or ischemia. Here I show a longitudinal image of the tibialis anterior, and we see a focal uh, discontinuity of the fascia with herniation of the muscle. We can also see fractures, and uh, an ultrasound is also useful for the evaluation of compartment syndrome. Um, commonly, uh, compartment syndrome commonly involves the anterolateral muscles, and it's caused by muscle overload. Uh, these patients can present like hematoma, um, uh, DBT, or ruptured Baker cyst, and uh, oftentimes that's how the, the evaluation will occur because um, we'll get an ultrasound for one of those reasons. Uh, and then again, on ultrasound, we'll see diffuse swelling, uh, blurring of the fiber adipose septa, uh, and loss of muscle architecture. Here's an image of the anterior tibia with uh, uh, cortical disruption, uh, a fracture. And then here's a, an image taken from a book uh, by Bianchi and Martinoli uh, showing um, progressive images coming from uh, caudal to cranial showing uh, loss of normal fiber adipose septa and the disruption of normal muscle architecture. In the posterior medial leg, uh, we commonly see tears, and uh, the prototypical tear is going to be a tear of the medial head of the gastrocnemius, or the so-called tennis leg, uh, sudden forceful active plantar flexion and extension of the knee, and these patients can present with thrombophlebitis, Baker's cyst rupture, or Achilles tendon tear. We can also see tears of the plantaris tendon. 
And here's an example of a soleus muscle strain with a hypochoic echo texture corresponding to a partial tear. And then here are two transverse images through the posterior calf showing a partial thickness tear of the plantaris tendon. All right, let's move on to the anterior ankle. The anterior ankle checklist includes uh, the anterior joint recess, uh, the extensor tendons, and the neurovascular bundle. Uh, so uh, as far as the extensor tendons go, we're talking about uh, tibialis anterior, uh, the extensor hallucis, and the extensor digitorum longus, or Tom, Harry, and Dick. So if you place your probe in the longitudinal position along the anterior joint, uh, you'll, you'll wind up with an image like this where you'll see the uh, tibia and talus in profile and then anterior joint rate recess. And then turn my probe in the uh, transverse position and we can see the all of the extensor tendons laid out very nicely and then uh, we do catch uh, some of the uh, we, we do catch the artery. Uh, again I want to emphasize a concept that we've been talking about through the whole throughout the whole course is toggling your ultrasound probe to take advantage of anisotropy and making the tendon much more conspicuous. Here I depict the anterior tibialis tendon becoming much more conspicuous on the right in its hypochoic. Okay, so here's tibialis anterior. It originates from the uh, lateral tibial condyle and the superior half of the lateral tibia in this exquisite netter drawing. It inserts on the medial and inferior surfaces of the medial cuneiform and base of the first metatarsal. If we place our probe in the transverse position, uh, just above the ankle, you'll wind up with a nice hypoechoic ovoid uh, tendon, and we can follow this structure up and down the leg to its insertion. If we change our position in a uh, longitudinal direction, then we can see the tendon laid out nicely. Uh, here I have it in uh, three positions, just above the, the ankle at the level of the tibia, uh, along the talus and then at its insertion on the first metatarsal or metocuneiform. Okay, here's the extensor hallucis longus. It originates from the anterior mid-fibula and interosseous membrane and inserts on the dorsal base of the great toe distal phalanx. Again, in the transverse position, we see a nice ovoid uh, hypoechoic tendon that can be followed along its uh, course to the great toe. And then if we change our orientation into the longitudinal position, again, we can lay out that tendon uh, along its course. And here I have it depicted along the talus, the first metatarsal shaft, uh, to its insertion on the distal phalanx. Here we can evaluate the uh, uh, neurovascular bundle, the dorsalis pedis artery, and the superficial perineal nerve in transverse, and of course, you know, color Doppler helps in that regard. Okay, and then uh, the last extensor tendon is the extensor digitorum longus, which originates along the lateral tibial condyle, upper fibula, and the interosseous membrane to insert on the middle and distal uh, phalanges of the second to fifth toes. Here I show the uh, extensor digitorum longus, which we see with its accompanying uh, extensor tendons. Um, Nice round ovoid, hypoechoic, and then closer to where the uh, tendons begin to split off, we see the four slips heading toward their respective uh, toes. Okay, so some of the things we can see in the anterior ankle um, uh, are problems with the tendons, and the tibialis anterior is going to be the most commonly affected. Uh, we can see partial or complete tears, and it's uh, most common to see tears uh, between the extensor retinaculum and its insertion. Now, the in, in a complete tear, the retracted tendon may actually simulate a mass or a cyst on, on physical exam. We can also see tendinopathy and tenosynovitis, which is a bit more common in the uh, extensor hallucis and digitorum tendons. Here's an example of the tibialis anterior tendon, uh, thickened and hypoechoic, consistent with partial thickness tear. Okay, let's move on to the lateral ankle. The checklist here includes the perineus longus and brevis tendons, uh, as well as uh, the ankle uh, collateral ligaments, the, the anterior talofibular, the calcaneal fibular, and the anterior tibiofibular ligaments. Perineus longus, uh, 
originates from the fibular head and the upper two-thirds of the lateral fibula to insert on the base of the first metatarsal and medial cuneiform after curving around the calcaneus. And then the peroneus brevis parallels the uh, peroneus longus, uh, originating from the lower two-thirds of the lateral fibula and inserting on the dorsolateral base of the fifth metatarsal. So if you place your probe in the transverse position just behind the malleolus, you'll see a nice uh, image showing uh, both tendons uh, posterior lateral to the fibula and notice the difference in echotexture relating to anisotropy. If you're familiar with MRI, here's a, uh, an axial image from an MRI that I've rotated to parallel uh, to match the image here shown on ultrasound. And again, we have both tendons uh, laid out very nicely uh, behind the posterior lateral aspect of the fibula. We can go transverse and uh, when you change uh, your, your probe into this position, we actually have uh, both uh, tendons laid out uh, quite nicely in one plane. So let's talk about the peroneus longus again. Uh, we find it uh, if we place it in the longitudinal position and it can be followed along its course into the uh, midfoot. Again, it dives around the calcaneus and here I have it uh, in a long, uh, longitudinal axis. Here's peroneus brevis. It parallels peroneus longus. And we can follow it all the way along its length longitudinally to its insertion on the base of the fifth metatarsal. All right, and then there's the lateral ankle ligaments. Um, the first is the anterior talofibular ligament. Here we have uh, a nice, um, uh, I'm sorry, hypoechoic tendon, I mean ligament uh, crossing the uh, fibula and talus. And then uh, the calcaneal fibular ligament, if we move the probe slightly posterior and angle upward, we'll get we'll catch the uh, calcaneal fibular ligament and you'll notice that it runs uh, just deep to the peroneus uh, brevis and perineal, peroneus longus tendons. And then lastly the anterior uh, tibia fibular ligament come up a little bit higher in a more transverse position and we have a nice tendon, I mean ligament, I'm sorry. All right, some of the things you can see in the lateral ankle most commonly are going to be ligamentous tears uh, and avulsion fractures, uh, very commonly related to inversion sprains and with uh, resulting from internal rotation of the foot and plantar flexion. And uh, typically, the anterior talofibular ligament is going to be the one most commonly torn, 70% of cases, and then a combination of the ATFL and calcaneal fibular ligament in the, the remaining uh, remainder of cases. It's relatively rare to see tears of the posterior talofibular ligament. Here's a, another image from uh, Bianchi and Martinoli's book showing uh, on the right a more normal um, ATFL uh, ligament and then uh, a thickened one compatible with partial thickness tear. We also see tendon tears and the uh, split tearing of the peroneus brevis is going to be most common. Um, causes are uh, as a result of ankle sprains, recurrent inversion, uh, chronic instability, or in patients who have systemic disease, including rheumatoid arthritis, uh, diabetes, and steroids. And um, in, in the elderly, this can be asymptomatic. Um, the longitudinal split can range in length from about two and a half to five centimeters, and it, it begins at the lateral malleolus and can go in both directions. Here's a, uh, two transverse images through the perineal tendons, and on the right we have a more normal appearing uh, perineal tendons, but on the left we see abnormal echotexture within the perineus brevis. That was a split tear. We can also see tears of perineus longus, and uh, that's usually associated with fracture of an os peroneum. And if we see widening of uh, the os peroneum fracture fragments by more than six millimeters, that suggests fracture with full thickness uh, tear. Uh, just remember that a bipartite osperineum can be a potential pitfall. This is a case that I got from a friend of mine at the University of Colorado, and here he shows uh, that there's a change in the position of the osperineum between the old and the new exam. So there was a suspicion for an underlying perineus longus tendon tear. We got an ultrasound. We see a thickened um, and loose 
osperineus longus tendon with a, attached to a fragmented osperineum. Here's the corresponding MRI. Again, an abnormal thick perineus longus uh, attached to a fragment. Uh, and then note the more normal appearing um, perineus brevis. Okay, moving on to the medial angle. Again, uh, the checklist includes the flexor tendons as well as the neurovascular bundle. And uh, for the flexor tendons, we're talking about tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, and flexor halysis, or Tom, Dick, and Harry. And then well, we also talk about the deltoid ligament. So here's tibialis posterior. Um, it originates from the interosseous membrane and posterior tibia to insert on the navicular, the cuneiform, cuboid bones, and base of the third, uh, second and third and fourth metatarsal bones. Here's flexor digitorum longus. It originates from the medial posterior tibia and a broad upper neurosis to the fibula to insert on the distal phalangeal bases of the second through fifth toes, crossing the uh, flexor halysis, as you see here. And here's flexor halysis originating from lower posterior fibula and interosseous membrane to insert on the base of the great toe distal phalanx. Uh, between the uh, flexor digitorum and flexor halysis, we have our posterior tibial artery and tibial nerve. Then here's the deltoid ligament complex, which uh, takes contributions from the tibio-navicular, tibio-calcaneal, and tibio-talar ligaments. So if you place your probe in the transverse position, uh, just below the uh, medial malleolus, you'll wind up with an image like this, which demonstrates the post-tibialis, posterior tibialis tendon and the flexor digitorum longus tendons. We also see the neurovascular bundle. I don't have the uh, flexor halysis on this image. We can uh, turn our probe to, to interrogate this tendon in the longitudinal direction, and again, uh, if we follow it to its insertion, uh, we, we can see it along its entire length. Uh, and then you can do the same for all of the other tendons, the flexor digitorum longus tendon, here's the neurovascular bundle, and again, um, here's the flexor halysis. Here's posterior tibialis tendon, flexor digitorum, and our flexor halysis. Here's the neurovascular bundle. So you can, this is actually very easy. All you have to do is just slap your probe in that position, and you'll find all those structures. And then to interrogate the tibial artery and the tibial nerve, um, you just need to use a little color Doppler to kind of help uh, outline the artery. And, and here's the, uh, the nerve with the normal fasciculations. The deltoid ligament uh, is uh, easy. We can see both the superficial and deep fibers just by placing our, our uh, probe in the, in the longitudinal position just over the uh, medial malleolus. And here's the corresponding uh, MRI. Okay, so common things we can see in the medial ankle. Uh, the tibialis posterior is the most commonly injured, and risk factors include middle-aged women, people who are obese, or those who have uh, rheumatoid arthritis or underlying seronegative uh, spondyloarthropathy. You can also injure it with uh, just fracturing, uh, and then uh, tearing of uh, usually occurs at the medial malleolus or navicular insertion. It results in collapse of the arch and resulting in pes planus, and then also a unilateral valgus deformity and stretching of the spring ligament. So here's an example of posterior tibialis tendinosus with thickening uh, of the tendon. Okay, moving on to the posterior ankle. This is sort of the last part of the talk. Uh, we're now, uh, so the checklist includes the Achilles tendon, the retrocalcaneal bursa, and the plantar fascia. So we place our probe in the uh, longitudinal direction just on top of the uh, Achilles tendon and we wind up with an image like this. And actually this is a panoramic um, view and this tendon actually lends itself very nicely to panoramic imaging. So here's the calcaneus and here's our tendon. We can go uh, transverse to that and we see a nice normal C-shaped appearance of the uh, Achilles tendon. 
in that same position, we can also uh, interrogate the retrocalcaneo bursa. And it should almost be imperceptible. And then uh, if we place our probe longitudinally on the posterior aspect of the foot, uh, I'm sorry, the plantar aspect of the uh, over the calcaneus, we can see a nice uh, tendon here, uh, the plantar fascia. Okay, so uh, we can see uh, tendinosis and uh, paratendinitis and um, thickening of the Achilles tendon from metabolic disease. And as far as tendinosis goes, it's bilateral in over 60% of cases and usually involves the proximal two thirds. Um, paratendinitis is a more normal appearing tendon with inflammatory change of the peritendin. And then we can see deposition within the Achilles tendon uh, with gout and heterozygous hypercholesterolemia. Here's an example of Achilles tendinosis with focal thick, fusiform thickening and uh, hypocotexture abnormality uh, compatible with tendinosis. We can also see tears um, and usually degeneration, uh, or hypoxic or mixoid degeneration leads to micro tearing and ultimately interstitial uh, tearing. You see about 7 million cases per year in our country and uh, more common in men and for some reason more often on the left. Uh, older age and sedentary lifestyle are uh, risk factors and it usually occurs two to six centimeters from the calcaneal insertion of the so-called critical zone. Uh, we can see uh, partial or full thickness tearing. On an ultrasound with full thickness tearing we'll see uh, the stumps abutting one another. Um, fat may herniate into the defect and then there are a couple of pitfalls to look out for uh, with a full thickness tear. The peritonin may remain intact and simulate partial uh, fiber uh, or in intact partial fibers. The, of the Achilles tendon. Um, also, the plantaris tendon can displace into the defect and also simulate a partially intact uh, Achilles. Uh, and then remember, in the postoperative Achilles, it's going to look abnormal. It'll be thickened, and we'll see uh, suture material holding the tendon together. So here's an example of a, of a full thickness Achilles tendon tear with uh, a, a you know a thin uh, rim of tissue from the peritonin. And then here's a, an example of a Achilles that's been repaired, and we see little specular uh, echogenicities, which are consistent with the uh, uh, suture material that was used to repair the tendon. And then lastly, we can see retrocalcaneal bursitis. Uh, common causes include uh, uh, systemic disease from rheumatoid arthritis or serenitic uh, spinal arthropathy. You can also see it in the setting of trauma, repetitive trauma, and it can also just be isolated. Here's uh, another uh, image from Bianchi and Martinoli's book showing uh, hypoechoic fluid in the retrocalcaneal bursa with inflammatory change. And uh, we also have, uh, you can also see plantar fasciitis. And it's the most common cause of heel pain, uh, resulting from increased traction of the calcaneal attachment, uh, leading to uh, micro tears followed by reactive inflammatory changes. Uh, on ultrasound, you'll see fascial thickening, hypoechoic echotexture with loss of the fibrillar pattern, and blurring of the superficial and deep borders of the fascia. And it just becomes very thickened, greater than 5 millimeters. Here's an example of a, uh, two different patients, a markedly thickened um, plantar fascia. And then here's the more normal appearing one. That's it.